thank you. Now, um, the surface heat flow is um, the quantity that tells us how a planet loses its heat. So we can calculate this by determining the um, uh, thermal conductivity and the temperature gradient, and it's basically the um, um, it's basically the um, um, uh, equation that you see there above. Now we have in situ um, um, heat flow measurements for the Earth and uh, Moon. And uh, with the InSight mission um, starting in 2016, we will also have uh, the first uh, in situ heat, fly, uh, heat flow measurement for, uh, for Mars. Now this, uh, the, the lander will carry a heat flow probe to the surface of Mars, and it will hammer into the ground and uh, will measure the thermal conductivity and the, tem the temperature gradient. Now, the natural question that arises is um, how large do we expect that the heat flow variation will be? Over the, uh, over the Mars surface at uh, present day. And uh, to answer this, we have uh, perfor performed a large number of um, numerical simulations and um, look at this, um, at this question. Now, um, another question that we also address in the this, in this study is, can we explain large elastic thickness um, um, uh, at, at, at the North Pole? that was um, inferred by previous stu studies to be at around, of around 300 kilometers. So can we look at our models, can we compute this from our models, and can we come up with a model that uh, can satisfy this constraint? Now, um, as I said before, we are performing um, 3D, fully dynamical um, simulations of planetary interiors, in this case for Mars, and this is a typical um, output of our uh, simulations. Now, um, for all the models that I will present here, we are assuming a crust, which has a low conductivity compared to the mantle. We have varied this a bit uh, between two and three watts per uh, meter Kelvin. Now, this crust also ha is enriched in heat-producing elements, and um, we have taken the uh, average value as was obtained um, uh, from the GRS measurements on, um, uh, uh, as you can see here. So from, from this paper, from uh, Han et al. 2011, and uh, we are distributing them homogeneously in the, in the crust. So um, uh, we also account for a north-south crustal uh, thickness dichotomy, as you can see there. So we have a thicker crust uh, in the south, about 60 kilometers, and a um, thinner crust in the north, about 30 kilometers. And what we are doing, we are varying um, rheological parameters in order to obtain different um, convection structures in the mantle and see how exactly the, um, um, the heat flow varies across the, across the surface. And all the, um, um, all the results that I will show are uh, results obtained after 4.5 billion years of uh, thermal evolution. And um, by doing thermal evolution, we are considering um, radiogenic decay and um, core cooling. So we have a temperature, um, uh, a, a time-dependent temperature condition at the, uh, at the bottom of the mantle. So first, starting with um, a strong depth-dependent viscosity, this was, has been ar argued to produce long uh, wavelength convection patterns, and um, even including um, 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 phase tra transition, we can basically trigger a, uh, a degree one structure. And you see here um, a series of papers that have uh, looked at this. And the problem with this um, is that the time needed for, um, for this degree one structure to, to establish is um, too long. So it, it is inconsistent with the um, dichotomy formation. Now, um, we have included in our models this, um, the temperature temperature and pressure depends of the, of the viscosity. And what you see here is are the heat flow variations over the surface, plotted on top of the uh, convection pattern after 4.5 billion years of evolution. And what we nicely see is the dichotomy caused, uh, caused by the, um, so we have here the, the crustal dichotomy, and this causes also, also a dichotomy in the heat flow. And we see increased heat flow over the upwellings. So I'll just try to speed this up a bit. A bit. So you see here an, an upwelling and an increased um, uh, heat flow value here on the south uh, part, on the south, southern hemisphere. Now, um, here's the, the heat flow map. 
um, at, after 4.5 billion years of, of evolution. So we observe here again the, the, the dichotomy in, in the heat flow caused by the uh, crustal dichotomy. And you can see also here, these are the places where we have the mantle upwellings. Now, what we can do, we can look at the average values that we obtain. So we have the um, average value, okay, I'll just use this one. We have the average value over the, over the surface, so the um, uh, mean average value, uh, so the, the average value over the entire surface, and we have the average value over the so, uh, southern hemisphere being um, a bit higher, as you can also observe here, and also um, uh, on the northern hemisphere. Now we can take now the, um, this plume here being the, the most strongest plume, and consider this would be the, um, uh, the Elysium region. Now we know uh, inside will uh, land close to this um, uh, region, and we can actually look at how far away we should be from this plume in order to not be affected by the heat flow variations caused by, uh, by this mantle upwelling. And uh, here you see uh, at around 25 degrees, if you average on this contour line here, we'll be pretty close to the, uh, surf uh, to the surface average on the southern um, hemisphere. Now, as I said, we obtain, in this case, when, when we include depth-dependent viscosity, so um, uh, the depth dependence of the viscosity results in um, a low degree convection pattern, and plumes are usually also accompanied by this, this uh, sheet-like structures. We can do a spherical harmonic um, analysis, and this is what we observe. So we have a dominant um, degree four uh, in the mantle, and what we can also do is to look at the elastic thickness. So here are the elastic th thickness variations um, computed from, from this model, and you can see again this type of dichotomy. You can also see it in the, in the elastic thickness. You, you see um, the, um, small elastic thickness above, um, above the up upwellings and large elastic thicknesses uh, where the downwellings are. And what, if you look pr um, very closely to this number here, it's about 224 um, kilometers, which is um, significantly lower than the 300 kilometer uh, estimate that we have. Now what we can also do, we can vary a bit the parameters and include um, the um Buzinesca approximation and phase tra transition, so basically adiabatic heating and phase transition. And what we see then is that the low degree convection par uh, pattern structures are, are uh, less prominent. We can also see this in the heat flow map here. We see uh, smaller variations um, over the surface. We see clearly the, the dichotomy, but we don't, uh, within the two hemispheres, we don't um, observe large vari variations in the heat flow. Now, um, doing the same exercise and looking at the uh, surface averages on the southern, northern, and the uh, entire um, uh, surface of, um, uh, so the values of, of the heat flow, and then averaging across this contour here, by assuming this would be the, the um, Elysium region. Now we see in this, in this case, we are also pretty close um, even to the, to the surface, the whole surface average. So um, as we've seen, heat flow variations are less pronounced. We can again look at the um, spherical harmonics analysis and we see this um, again. Uh, and here we have a less dominant low degree convection pattern and looking at the, cr at the, at the um, elastic thickness, we again observe here as well uh, less variations. So we observe the, the dichotomy again, but within the two hemisphere, hemispheres, we have less variations. And the highest value here is around 220, which is again um, uh, lower than the, than the estimate um, at the North Pole. Now, it was also argued that um, a jump in the, in the mid-mantle, in the viscosity, will cause um, also a long wavelength pattern. And depending on, this, on, on the location of the jump and on the, um, on the strength of this jump, you can obtain either a um, um, ridge-like structure or even a degree one. However, um, this, this jump is relatively high, so um, it's a bit unclear what, what um, what would cause this, um, this viscosity jump. Nevertheless, we have tested this in our model, 
And uh, what we see here, we obtain with, a, uh, uh, with such a jump in the mid-mantle, in the viscosity um, uh, ridge pattern in the mantle. And I can also let this, oops, sorry. Here we go. We see um, heat flow variations uh, along this, this uh, jump structure, uh, along this ridge uh, structure. So we also see large heat flow, heat flow variations at the um, dichotomy boundary when, when we approach the, the ridges of, uh, of this jump, uh, of this, um, the, the ends of this ridge. Now, um, if we look at the uh, surface um, heat flow map, we again recognize here this, this one ridge structure in the mantle with um, high uh, heat flow variations um, at, the, at the two ends of the, of the ridge. We can do the same um, exercise as before and look at the um, surface heat flow at the entire surface average or uh, only at the uh, surface, um, at the southern hemisphere or northern hemisphere. And we will see that we are also in this case about 1.5 milliwatts per square meter uh, above the uh, southern hemisphere average. Now, um, if we look at the um, uh, spherical harmonics um, analysis, we uh, um, obtain again, in this case, a low degree structure. And this is also um, uh, visible in the elastic thickness. So you have here, again, um, uh, along the ridge, you have a low elastic thickness. And the highest value that we obtain in this model is about 236 kilometers, which is still uh, considerably lower than the 300 kilometers um, uh, estimate. So to conclude, in all models, the heat flow, the, surf the average heat, um, surface heat flow is between 24 and 25 milliwatts per square meter. But um, the variations are depending on the uh, convection structure um, in the mantle. So if we have a low degree convection, convection structure, we, we will have a, um, a variation of about 14 milliwatts per square meter. And we, if we exclude the crustal contribution, because we have this crustal dichotomy, we will um, uh, obtain variations of about 10 milliwatts per square meter between um, upwellings and downwellings, basically. Um, if we don't have this low degree structure, then the um, variations in the heat flow surface are, are um, significantly lower. So excluding crustal uh, contribution, we will have around 2 milliwatts per square meter. If we look at the um, results, including uh, adiabatic uh, heating and in phase transition, we observe that the, uh, the surface heat flow variations are smaller. And that's basically because of this temperature jump across the um, um, lower boundary, and uh, that in the case with when, when we do not include these effects is larger and there therefore um, um, is visible at the, in the um, surface heat flow variations. Now for the elastic lithosphere thickness, what we've seen is that um, in our models we have lower values than the estimates. So here's a, a model where we have increased the cross conductivity and we even um, assumed or taken into account um, surface temperature variations of about 60K between um, equator and poles. So the best or the highest value that we have is about 250, which is still lower than the 300 kilometer estimate. So um, yeah, to explain this, either we have to look again at the um, elastic thickness models or uh, maybe indeed Mars is, uh, is uh, subchondritic so basically, inside by doing this measurement, we'll um, test the um, Venkadribus model, which is at the moment the most um, accepted model, compositional model for Mars. And what we also plan to do is to compute um, for all these models that we've uh, done here, the geoid, in order to um, have um, more constraints and then to um, try to, to choose the best model um, that will represent the surface variation, heat flow surface variation for Mars. Thank you.